Perfect. Uh, well, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Natalie Halberg, who is going to give a talk on philosophy's madness as uh, narcissism. So a little bit about uh, Dr. Natalie Helberg. She is a lecturer at the University of Concordia in Montreal. Uh, she got her PhD in philosophy at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on 20th and 21st century continental philosophy. And her other research interests include depression discourse, feminist philosophy, psychoanalysis, and the philosophy of literature. And I would like to add that uh, when she was a lecturer at the University of Toronto, uh, her course, PHLB04, Philosophy and Literature, uh, was an amazing course. It was one of my favorites, and it really uh, jump-started my interest in uh, pursuing a minor in philosophy. And I was so grateful to have her as a prof, and I hope that her students at Concordia feel the same. Is there anything you would like to add to your intro, Dr. Helberg? <laughs> um, I would just like to say thank you. That was so generous of you, all of that. Um, and it, it was just so amazing, actually, to have you reach out and invite me to do this. Um, so nice to sort of interact with a student who I have become familiar with right from classes um, and do something, you know, quite maybe unrelated to those classes, right? Just a totally different project. Um, so yeah, just thank you. <laughs> and it's so nice to hear that um, the philosophy and literature class uh, did something for you, so. <laughs> yes, yeah. I am going to uh, pin you now so that uh, your face is up on the Zoom and uh, you can get started whenever you're ready. Hey, great. Um, so I did prepare a paper, uh, which means that uh, this talk is going to have the air of a paper <laughs> being read because that's what it is. Um, but it's not a fully drafted out paper. So there will be sections that are sort of casual uh, and then uh, possibly some mediating moments between sections that I would need to flesh out a little more. Uh, so that's the situation. I'm sort of walking you through uh, a text that I am not through with, <laughs> uh, that I, I still need to, you know, continue to, to sort of work out. Um, okay, so my intro is very informal. I felt the need to script it, but it's very casual. Uh, so this is a work in progress. Um, I'm sure people saw the abstract. Essentially, I am just trying to find a way to talk about the exchange that occurred between Foucault and Derrida on the subject of Foucault's reading of Descartes' uh, meditations on first philosophy um, in some kind of fresh way. People have talked about it. There are books on it. Um, I just uh, was interested in, in wrapping my head around the debate in a really philosophically rigorous way. But of course, in philosophy, you also have to find a way to make uh, make your project uniquely your own. So it's not just about explaining, right? Explaining what went down in the exchange, even though I had this desire to figure that out. Um, so uh, I, I sort of came up with this wild idea that was designed to, to help me speak about the exchange in a way that was a bit more novel. I'm not sure that it works, right? So that's, that's, that's uh, the attempt that's being made here. Um, okay. So I actually don't think that the debate shows that Derrida and Foucault are deeply at odds at a conceptual level. So part of the discussion will involve me explaining why I think that is. It seems as if other people in the literature have uh, taken this line. So my hope is that I'm taking maybe a line that other people have taken, but I'm giving it different inflections, maybe pointing to the like different nooks and crannies in Foucault and Derrida in an attempt to shore up uh, that line. So it is playful. Sometimes I get informal. Um, I'm essentially, you know, trying to just see what happens uh, to the debate and uh, 
sort of try to see if any new possibilities open up as far as discoursing on the relationship between Foucault and Derrida uh, go. Um, when we read the exchange uh, with, with an eye to specifying the, the madness that is being discussed, the, mad, the, the madness that is sort of at the center of the exchange um, as a specific form of madness and like pathological narcissism. So I'm, I'm sort of specifying the form of madness that is at the center of the discussion as pathological narcissism. Uh, but this is not something that either Foucault or Derrida um, end up uh, doing. And, the, and, and there are reasons for this. So I'll sort of explain why they refuse to specify madness. But I think that if we do specify madness and specify it as pathological narcissism, we start to see things um, that we wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, and maybe more specifically, um, we we get a, a clear a clearer sense or a different sense of how both thinkers are offering us a similar tool set for engaging in philosophical critique. So that's sort of the new thing that we're seeing if we if we use pathological narcissism as what I referred to as an avatar for madness in the title of the talk. Um, okay. Uh, what else do I have to tell you? I guess the, the larger question that I'm sort of broaching, but I'm not really answering the question, and I hope I'm not doing it in too laughable a way, um, is uh, the question of whether uh, narcissism is compatible with thinking and philosophy. So the, the Foucault-Derrida debate is um, in, in some ways just a debate about the relationship between madness and thinking or madness and discoursing or madness and philosophy. <laughs> um, so that, are these things compatible uh, when they're not compatible? How are they not compat compatible and things like that? These are very much the questions. Um, so I'm just sort of, you know, posing those the, the same questions in a different way. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess posing posing the same questions, but just subbing in narcissism for madness and seeing where that gets us, seeing how that changes things. Okay, so just to, to start, uh, I, I have to say a few things about narcissism. I have to give you a sense of my my sort of my, my image of narcissism, the one that's grounding the, the later claims in the text. So that's the first section. In the second section, I actually get to the Foucault-Derrida exchange, um, and uh, that, that basically takes us to the end. Um, so... I've, I've sort of laid out the various tasks that are the tasks I uh, am relating to as my key tasks. So first section, narcissism and contemporary philosophy. I'll launch into reading now, so it won't just be me in this sort of chaotic manner, <laughs> ruminating and referring to jot notes on a page. So narcissism and contemporary philosophy. In this section, I explore some of the ways in which the philosophical discipline might be said to possess a narcissistic structure. What is pathological narcissism? Narcissus, the mythological character the pathology was named for, is the epitome of a non-relational self. Incapable of loving anything other than his own reflection, he lives a stagnant life, a life myopically devoted to the surface of the pond which refracts his likeness. Then he dies. It is not clear that being self-absorbed is fatal for the self, not clear that Narcissus died of this cause. All that is clear is that Narcissus lived and died without becoming otherwise. There were casualties, of course. Echo, the representative of alterity in the tale, wasted away to insubstantiality, codependent and grieved. Narcissus, while alive, could not have registered her. Her utterances were consigned to be duplications of his own a narrative detail that makes Narcissus's solipsism consummate. There are varieties of narcissism. Psychologists and psychoanalysts tell us that young children are narcissistic. From the child's perspective, only its own body and needs are tangible realities. Other selves and objects are real only to the extent that they are ministering. That is, the child relates to the other's substance as real only to, only to the extent that it can be usurped. It exists for the child as that which can be sapped precisely because it exists for the child as just an extension of its own substance. This healthy primary narcissism, as it's called, is supposed to fade with age, 
A growing awareness of an objective external reality helps it fade. The child becomes increasingly differentiated from other embodied selves. A certain degree of narcissism, of course, is adaptive and necessary even in adults. As Derrida points out, even the most open, responsible relations we bear to others are contingent on the self-containment narcissism implies. Specifically, pathological forms of narcissism in adults exhibit a few hangovers from primary narcissism. The pathological narcissist is self-absorbed to the point of being oblivious to the needs and feelings of others. They lack empathy. They relate to others as mere extensions of the self, mere energies which can be enlisted to serve the self in its quest to fulfill its own desires and satisfy its own needs. Because they feel entitled to the other's substance, they display a flagrant disregard for the other's boundaries. They do not relate to the other as a distinct person to be respected. Hand in hand with the narcissist's disregard for the other is a tendency to overvalue and overestimate the self. Narcissists believe that they know and know best. They claim a privileged apprehension of how things are. As a result, they do not take well to criticism and resent being challenged. Defensiveness is standard. Hostility and aggression in response to being questioned are not unheard of. YouTube abounds with videos designed to help victims of narcissistic abuse recover from and avoid narcissistic rage. The emotional supernova with which the narcissist confronts those who, who threaten their status as the self-designated arbiter of everything or as the ultimate authority. There is no dialoguing with the narcissist to resolve interpersonal problems in a mutually respectful manner. For the narcissist, this form of dialogue can only be legible as a confrontation, an invitation to fight and win. And make no mistake, the narcissist has an inordinate need to win. The hapless souls who find themselves in romantic relationships with narcissists or in a lonely situation with few options. The narcissist is incapable of acknowledging and accommodating the other's perspective. Thus, the narcissist cannot hear and respond to the other's grievances, and thus the chances that they will grow and change are slim. Narcissists are notorious for refusing to conceive of themselves as the problem. The form of self-awareness that enables self-critique and a corresponding form of self-transformation is beyond them. They rarely seek professional help as a result. They are stagnant, stunted sorts just as Narcissus was a stagnant, stunted sort, living a life consisting entirely of his ipsity circulated back to him. So, those who find themselves haplessly embroiled with the pathological narcissist have two options. They can accept the situation and do their best to weather the dissatisfactions and loneliness of their relationships until their own lives end, or they can leave. There is no fighting the pathological narcissist, no changing the pathological narcissist, responding to the narcissist with an open, hopeful, generous, dialogical heart is to affect a category mistake. Walking away, psychologists often insist, is the only truly viable option. I'm reminded of a talk by a feminist philosopher I attended a few years ago. She described herself only half jokingly as philosophy's bitter acts. It seemed the discipline had proven itself immune to whatever feminist interventions she had been trying to effect. Many years ago, a philosophical hero of mine switched their academic appointment because they found the philosophy department they called home was making it difficult for them to do the political work they were interested in doing. Another hero of mine retired early, indicating on social media that after all of her years in the discipline, she had not felt validated as a philosopher, possibly because of her choice of texts or possibly because of the unconventional ways in which she had approached these texts. Decades after the canon wars, the traditional philosophical canon seems relatively intact. It seems many of the discipline's disciples proceed assured of what philosophy is and isn't. The contemporary university's culture of compulsory inclusivity promotes superficial forms of inclusiveness, as Sarah Ahmed points out. Individuals are hired so that departments, including philosophy departments, can tick the administrative boxes related to diversity they are required to, 
If the university or department in practice actually falls short of fulfilling its commitment to diversity by creating conditions unfavorable to it, it can point to the boxes it has ticked and the diverse people it has hired to do PR. Universities and departments ostensibly committed to diversity, in fact, reveal themselves to be committed to managing their images, which operate as rugs they can sweep and hence conceal their failures under. Attempts to make universities and departments accountable for their failures in this way fail. In the end, they can do no wrong. To what extent do philosophy departments in the philosophical discipline construed more broadly exhibit the traits of a narcissist, positioning those who invite its transformation through their ways of working or even overt complaints as those whose only viable option it is to leave? To what extent is philosophy's resistance to change or a philosophy department's resistance to change since individual departments bear an interesting constitutive relation to the discipline in general? legible as narcissism. In a short piece from the 1980s, Stephen James Bartlett explores the respects in which both the personalities of philosophers and their theories can be described as narcissistic. This maneuver is a way of discoursing about philosophy from a vantage point outside of it, the vantage point of psychology. This is an interesting move to make precisely because philosophy has historically reserved the right to think about everything, to take any object as the object of its reflections, including itself, without displaying much of an interest in what perspectives external to philosophy have to say about philosophy. In some ways, I understand my paper as affecting a similar gesture. It is lodged in the provocation of being not quite philosophy proper, Otherwise, though, I'm relating to Bartlett's paper as a point of contrast for the more recent cr critique of philosophy by Christy Dotson, which I will use to ground my own proposal that contemporary philosophy's structure is narcissistic. Bartlett essentially argues that the philosophical discipline attracts people who are unwilling to be corralled by shared standards of evaluation. They exhibit the narcissist's aversion to the thought of being displaced as an absolute authority, the thought of having to submit to another authority or take another's perspective seriously. He sketches the discipline as an anarchic space in which headstrong people produce whatever philosophies their uninterrogated biases and idiosyncratic whims incline them to without encountering genuine opposition. Philosophers, he suggests, are skilled at both defending their views and attacking opposition and have no genuine interest in reconsidering their work in light of other people's responses to it. They are uncompromisingly invested in it. This narcissism, Bartlett suggests, is possible precisely because of the discipline's lack of standards of evaluation that would be applicable to all. He quotes Husserl approvingly, philosophers meet, but unfortunately not the philosophies. The philosophies lack the unity of a mental space in which they might exist for and act on one another. In commensurate philosophies, divergent views proliferate as a result, and in the absence of uncontroversial norms of evaluation, Bartlett laments, it is impossible to adjudicate between them. Bartlett's concern with a lack of shared standards of evaluation seems somewhat naive. His sketch of the discipline makes the discipline look oddly bereft of the features of any disciplinary space that make possible training and accreditation and which persist in the habits of those passing through degree programs well after they have received their degrees. Training and accreditation do imply somewhat uniform standards of evaluation. Dotson sketches the philosophical discipline roughly 25 years after Bartlett does in her essay, How is this paper philosophy? And this time, obstinate standards, which are violently assumed to be shared and which are uniformly imposed, come into sight as precisely what makes the discipline a candidate for a narcissistic diagnosis. In Dotson's new picture, these standards are the culprit. They are not the solution for the problem of narcissism. The problem of narcissism in this new picture has less to do with what for Bartlett is the vexing proliferation of diverse philosophical perspectives and more to do with the features of the discipline, which make it difficult for diverse practitioners to flourish in the discipline. 
the diverse practitioner she has in mind, or a motley bunch. Diversity here, she writes, is meant to include not only racial, ethnic, gendered, sexual, and ability diversity, uh, but to also include diverse approaches to philosophy, Eastern, applied, engaged, field work, field, public, experimental, literary approaches, etc. Dotson doesn't explicitly invoke the notion of narcissism in her discussion, but the relationship between the features of the discipline she problematizes and the symptoms of pathological narcissism discussed above will not be difficult to detect. Dotson argues that the philosophical discipline sustains a culture of justification. Individuals are forced to legitimate their work by articulating the ways it conforms to norms which are assumed to be, one, accepted by all philosophical interlocutors, and two, relevant to all philosophical enterprises. The very pervasiveness of the question, how is this paper philosophy, which implies that a piece of writing is falling short of a standard that must be met, is, Dotson suggests, a symptom of this culture of justification. The norms philosophy enshrines facilitate different forms of silent exclusion. Not all practitioners subscribe to dominant norms in the first place. Even those who do, uh, sorry, even those who do not are evaluated in terms of their ability to conform to these norms, however. Intentional deviance from these norms is thus legible only as failure, not as thoughtful subversion. Dotson points to Donadel Marcano as a philosopher subject to this specific form of exclusion, which she calls exclusion via incongruence. Marcano does not accept the expectation that philosophical theorizing begins from the broadest possible vantage point, yet points out that her work and other work which grounds itself in the lives and experiences of Black women is often conceived as too particular to be philosophical. The stubborn resistance to transformation Dotson is drawing our attention to, the philosophical discipline's incapacity to achieve critical distance from what it perceives to be the way of doing things, even when confronted with alternative ways of doing things, its inability to really register alternative ways of working for what they are, its oblivious and therefore almost laughably innocent insistence on viewing alternative ways of working philosophically, alternative visions of philosophy as failed philosophy or is not even philosophical enough to be failed philosophy, are narcissistic symptoms. Philosophy's narcissism, as it appears in Dotson's sketch, is essentially what Lyotard termed terror in the postmodern condition. The world Lyotard describes in this report, which bears on the processes of legitimating knowledge that were discernible towards the end of the 20th century and likely still persist today, is a tissue made up of myriad language games. Um, this is what he says. It is a monster formed by the interweaving of various networks of heteromorphous classes of utterances. The rules or norms governing these different language games are not commensurable. Science, to be good science, must proceed in an entirely different manner than narrative has to proceed to be good narrative. No neutral meta standards for adjudicating between rule sets exist, moreover. Leotard suggests that in the absence of the legitimating narratives that justified knowledge production before the postmodern era, knowledge legitimation occurs via transformative interactions between language games with different rules, or what he terms paralogy. This form of legitimation does not entail consensus in any straightforward way. A language game sufficiently responsive to others as it competes with others, Leotard seemed to think, would not be able to take its governing rules for granted. These rules would be cast into relief during its interactions with other language games and thus, becomes, and thus become objects of critical reflection. If still provisionally upheld, they would at least be consciously upheld. The possibility that they would be jettisoned or reconfigured as a result of these interactions would, moreover, be on the table at all times. The philosophical discipline Dotson is describing is one made up of multiple language games, diverse philosophical practices, with incommensurable rules, 
Each distinct game is governed by unique standards for assessing the moves made within the game as good or bad, admissible or inadmissible. A good move in one game is not necessarily a good move in another. However, in the sketch dots and offers of the discipline, it seems paralogy is not possible. Terror for Leotard corresponds to a situation in which a single language game achieves hegemony and insists on the absolute status of its own rules. It is unable to even register statements made according to the terms of other language games. Those who speak according to the terms of other language games are unable to appear within the social field as a result. The hegemonic situation makes them unintelligible. In this sense, they are forced to play the dominant language game. They must play or disappear. The decision maker's arrogance, Leotard writes, consists in the exercise of terror. It says, adapt your aspirations to our ends or else. The philosophical norms which Dotson problematizes are operating in the way the rules of a terrorizing language game operate. They impose themselves as the only standards rather than as one set of standards among others. They refuse to acknowledge alternative vantage points and in this way shield themselves from the possibilities of self-critique and revision. We might equally analyze their operation in terms of what Dotson articulates as contributory injustice in a text examining the respects in which the discourse on epistemic injustice can itself perpetuate epistemic injustice. Contributory injustice, which Dotson argues Miranda Fricker's work on epistemic injustice is insensitive to, occurs when a person willfully ignores alternative frameworks for understanding, which are available in the world they inhabit. Unlike testimonial injustice, this form of injustice does not involve relating to an interlocutor as less credible. One can fail to recognize an alternative framework for understanding that the other person happens to be using without viewing the particular person this way. Unlike hermeneutic injustice, Contributory injustice is not produced by the absence of the hermeneutical resources, for example, concepts and frameworks, marginalized subjects need to fully understand their experience in a culture, though it is produced by the marginalization of some hermeneutical resources relative to others. The diverse philosophy practitioners Dotson is concerned with do have access to alternative ways of thinking about what the philosophical enterprise is. These alternative understandings of philosophy are not validated, however, though it would be possible for those withholding validation to come to appreciate them by familiarizing themselves with hermeneutical resources, like ideas, discourses, and ways of thinking, available to them in their time and place. They're too blithe, too narcissistic to do this work, though. The prospects of diversity of the diverse practitioner in philosophy are according to Dotson Bleak. Although she feels, sorry, although she herself feels it is possible to productively call for a shift away from the culture of justification in philosophy, she also in different ways makes it clear that challenging the discipline's dominant norms will be an enervating and often even futile endeavor. As is the case when navigating a relationship with a pathological narcissist, it is sometimes just best to leave. As Dotson states, the burden of shifting justifying norms within a professional environment that manifests symptoms of a culture of justification involves sacrificing one's labor and energies towards providing a catalyst for change via numerous legitimating narratives aimed at gaining positive status for oneself as a philosopher and one's projects as philosophical. Let me make the strong statement that shouldering this burden and the set of experiences one exposes oneself to is not a livable option for many would-be diverse practitioners of philosophy and the small numbers of underrepresented populations within professional philosophy attest to this observation. There are, to speak euphemistically, better working environments for diverse practitioners, which may not be perfect, but may certainly count as providing more opportunities for the success of one's own life and projects than professional philosophy. Okay, so that was philosophy sketched as a possible narcissist, as a structure with a possible narcissistic 
uh, sort of uh, quality. Um, and of course, I'm trying to think about Foucault and Derrida as providing tools for crit critiquing philosophy when it is narcissistic. Um, okay, so be before we get there, I'm going to move us through the Foucault-Derrida debate. I'm really sorry if this is technical. I, I was sort of trying to, you know, um, be be clear and accessible, but it, it it just occurred to me that, like after after I'd sort of done the writing, that it it's probably going to be fairly opaque for people who haven't uh, sort of had any you know ex any sort of experience uh, reading the debate and and stuff like that. Um, it helps to have to have Descartes in your back pocket, though. Uh, okay, so uh, the Foucault-Derrida debate. In the history of madness, Foucault chronicles cultural transformations, which resulted in the occlusion of a certain understanding and experience of madness, which was possible during the Middle Ages and up to the Renaissance. This madness was supposed to be natural, universal, and tragic, the lot of all persons, an attestation to human finitude and fallenness, as well as to the world's terrors and uncertainty. It was understood to interface with night with a capital N. It had promiscuous relations with truth and knowledge, was missable with truth and knowledge. Before its cultural exclusion and occlusion, Foucault suggests, uh, sorry, before its cultural exclusion and occlusion, Foucault suggests in this text, no distinct border between reason and madness existed. A new era of reason was instituted though through the acts which relegated this madness to cultures immemorial outside and along with it, a new conception of madness. The madness we now know as mental illness, as an abnormal affliction, as aberration, medicalized madness. This new form of reason and the madness it takes as its object bear entirely different relations to one another. They are mutually exclusive. Reason, or the numerous avatars of this reason discernible in cultural practices, legal discourses, moral discourses, medical discourses, psychiatric discourses, philosophical discourses, and more, can no longer mutate fluidly into madness and madness can no longer reasonably, truthfully, and knowledgeably hold forth. The new reason, moreover, Foucault tells us, reserves the exclusive right to discourse on madness, the right to articulate madness or determine what madness is. It does this as it goes about articulating madness as mental illness and the opposite of reason. The resulting situation is one in which mental illness cannot speak on its own behalf, reason speaks for it, and the more awesome, tragic form of madness which preceded it no longer even surfaces as the object of any discourse. Not without reservations as to the possibility of this undertaking, Foucault sets out to determine the conditions and events which led to the silencing, the cultural ejection and forgetting, of the form of madness he should theoretically, that is, if his assessment of the contemporary situation vis-a-vis -vis the old form of madness is accurate, have no awareness of and no access to. This enterprise is his archaeology of silence. In February of 1963, two years after the text publication, Derrida writes to Foucault, indicating an intention to produce a paper on the text. I think I'll try to show basically that your reading of Descartes is legitimate and illuminating, but at a deep level that in my view, uh, sorry, but at a deep level that in my view cannot be the level of the text you are using. It's sort of a grammatically strange phrase and it is just in a letter uh, that, that Derrida sent to Foucault. Foucault had devoted a few scanty paragraphs at the beginning of his second chapter to arguing that the meditations on first philosophy is symptomatic of the larger cultural trend he was diagnosing in the hundreds of pages which constitute his book. The relevant moment in the text for Foucault, uh, for Foucault's purposes, is the moment Descartes temporarily reneges on the heuristic, doubt everything that has ever deceived you once. The heuristic, of course, would allow Descartes to efficiently purge himself of all dubious knowledge acquired by means of the senses 
since the latter had proven themselves to be sufficiently deceptive, and since what is established on any basis will crumble when that basis crumbles. Just sort of walking you through some of Descartes. I mean, for those of you in the room who have done uh, Descartes meditations on first philosophy, you'll sort of recognize these little maneuvers. Um, and Foucault and, and uh, Derrida are really just focusing on the details of the text and are trying to make something of them. But Descartes hesitates. There are many beliefs, he reasons, derived from the senses that seem nonetheless impossible to doubt. That I am here sitting by the fire, he writes, wearing a winter dressing gown, holding this paper in my hands, and so on. How could it be, uh, how could it be denied that these hands or this whole body are mine? unless perhaps I were to liken myself to madmen whose brains are so damaged by the persistent vapors of melancholia that they firmly maintain they are kings when they are paupers, or say they are dressed in purple when they are naked, or that their heads are made of earthenware, or that they are pumpkins or made of glass. But such people are insane, and I would be thought equally mad if I took anything from them as a model for myself. So that was just all Descartes. Uh, in the quotation. This dogmatic dismissal of the possibility that the meditating subject could be, could be mad replicates in the philosophical microcosm of Descartes' text, Foucault argues, the broader and culturally founding trend of silencing tragic madness. The rational meditator who is able to entertain the possibility that what he is experiencing as reality is really a dream who is later able to entertain the possibility that he is no more than an immaterial substance subjected to the, to the manipulations of an evil demon, is only able to proceed with the rational project of the meditations, with the method of radical doubt and its two core thought experiments, once madness is excluded. So this is uh, Foucault's line. So this is the argument in the history of madness, uh, his way of reading Descartes in the history of madness. Derrida's analysis of the history of madness challenges this assessment. The history of the reception of his response by Foucault is vicissitudinous. Foucault sometimes seemed to embrace and admire it. At other moments, it seemed to inspire a certain degree of ire. Even when it did, it seemed possible that this was less because of its content and more because Derrida and Foucault had had a general falling out over Derrida's refusal to request to have critical remarks pertaining to Foucault excised from a review of his work. In the end, both thinkers resumed amicable relations. Derrida agrees that Descartes' meditator is eventually required to reject madness as a possibility, but suggests that this occurs at a point much later in the text than Foucault had suggested. In the initial phases of the text, Derrida argues, as the meditator entertains both the dreaming hypothesis and that of the evil demon, madness and reason exhibit compatibility. Both the dreaming hypothesis and that of the evil demon, both the pertinences of Descartes' rational method, are hyperbolized forms of madness. Descartes' method is as rational, then, as it is irrational. Entertaining the possibility that what appears to be tangible reality is just the effect of a dream or the effect of a demon is a process madder than any concrete form of madness. This is Derrida's take. Those who are concretely mad, Derrida suggests, are generally not mistaken about everything. They, they may believe they are the king, for instance, and yet also accurate belie accurately believe themselves to have hands. Commonplace madness is not a sufficiently potent resource for the method of doubt then. Beyond this, it is not a universal experience. Only some fall mad. If the thinking in the text is to appeal then to a non-philosophical addressee, if it is to entice the non-philosophical addressee to follow the meditating philosopher along, more relatable sources of suspicion must propel the meditation's method. Derrida suggests that the dogmatic dismissal of madness in the text at the moment Foucault reads so much into, but such people are insane, and I would be thought equally mad if I took anything from them as a model for myself, is uttered by a voice distinct from the meditation's main narrative voice, 
The main narrative voice then goes on to say facetiously, a brilliant piece of reasoning, as if I were not a man who sleeps at night and regularly has all the same experiences while asleep as madmen do when awake, indeed, sometimes even more improbable ones. In Derrida's reading then, madness is sustained in a form compatible with reason up to the point of the cogito. Even the truth of the cogito is compatible with madness it withstands the hyperbolic form of madness that is the evil demon hypothesis. Quote, the cogito escapes madness only because at its own moment, under its own authority, it is valid even if I am mad, even if my thoughts are completely mad. There is a value and meaning of the cogito as of existence, which escapes the alternative of a determined madness or a determined reason. So somehow this moment of absolute certainty, I think therefore I am the sort of, I guess, culturally common sort of too easy version <laughs> doesn't quite capture all of the inflections of the cogito, uh, but I'll get, I'll get back to the, the one that does later. Um, somehow this is uh, able to withstand a state of total madness. You can be totally mad and yet still land on the truth of the, of the cogito, and that truth will still stand. This moment in Derrida's reading is key when it comes to articulating the philosophical significance of this quibble between Foucault and Derrida regarding the proper reading of Descartes' text. And it is more than a quibble about how to read Descartes. The disparate approaches to the reading of Descartes at first glance seem to point to different ways of envisioning philosophical criticism and of imagining the relationship between culture and its outside. The relation between reason and madness at this point of the cogito in, Derrida, in Derrida's reading will be discernible as a relation of difference to readers familiar with Derrida's thought. That is to say, reason and madness participate in one another while remaining distinct. Derrida suggests that they exist in this relation beyond culture and time, at least up to a certain point in the text. His zero point of the cogito, he tells us, quote, opens and founds the world by exceeding it, end quote. He insists the hyperbolical project, quote, is not supposed to be reducible to a determined historical totality, end quote. This is in keeping with his conceptualization of difference as the impure origin of any system. Derrida was, of course, preoccupied with positing and specifying difference in different ways in different works. Here, a complex relation between madness and reason constitutes it, but other categories can be invoked to articulate the same relation, the same impure origin. Whereas Foucault in History of Madness seems to point to reason's historical genesis, to reason's institution in time, on a temporal continuum, that is, through an act of exclusion, an act of ejecting and forgetting a certain conception of madness, Derrida points to an aporia outside of time, ascribing a similar function to it. This aporia is, Derrida tells us, what will make it possible for reason and madness to be stated in their difference. He seems to mean to come to be specified as reason and mental illness, calling back to Foucault's claim that this division eventually occurs. The situation is slightly more complex than this. The aporia, which functions as the origin of the division between reason and madness, sorry, reason and mental illness on Derrida's account, assuming that's what he meant when he says that this aporia actually makes possible the distinction between reason and madness. Um, so hold on. Ah, the situation is slightly more complex than this. The aporia, which functions as the origin of the division between reason and mental illness on Derrida's account as an aporia, is not easily spatialized or easily situated with respect to a temporal continuum. For Derrida, it will be neither entirely beyond history and culture, nor fully internal to history and culture. Difference is, he tells us in the essay with the same name, no more structural than historical. Sometimes Derrida specifies the aporias he is concerned with as the play between the inside of the system and its outside, other times he articulates the apparatic quality of the origin, the impure nature of the origin, by indicating that what is radically outside manifests as a trace within the system, 
It is present in the system, but only as absent. So madness would be somehow present within reason, but also beyond reason. This is one way of articulating the idea that madness and reason are sort of compatible at the moment of the cogito. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. But for some reason, in the, the reading of Foucault's History of Madness, Derrida um, tends to, to talk about the origin of history and the origin of reason as just an aporia totally outside of time. Um, but it might make a difference to appreciate that you could equally think of it as, as just uh, something that's sort of within history and also outside of it at the same time in this complex way. So I'm going to come back to that. That will be relevant for us later. The insight that the kind of origin Derrida is spotlighting, that is as an alternative to the kind of origin Foucault is spotlighting, because uh, Foucault, of course, he's thinking about an origin that happens in history. So there's an act of ejecting a certain form of madness that happens in time, and that gives rise to an era of of reason. So it's the origin of that era of reason, even though it happens in time. So it's a very different story about an origin that we're getting from Derrida. Um, so the insight that the kind of origin Derrida is spotlighting, that it is as an alternative to the kind of origin Foucault is spotlighting, is difficult to spatialize and difficult to situate in time, allows us to appreciate a curious feature of Derrida's argument in the text and to begin to dissolve what initially appears as the stark contrast between Foucault and Derrida's respective ways of thinking exteriority. So it's the, the thing that's outside. Uh, for Derrida, it's this weird aporia outside of time, call it madness in relation to reason when there's no clear border between them. For Foucault, the, ex the exterior thing is the excluded form of madness um, and, and possibly the act of rejecting it, which is now... Uh, not something that we can culturally remember and that, that Derrida is trying to excavate. Oops, I lost my place. Um, so, so Derrida essentially agrees that madness is excluded in the meditations on first philosophy. He only differs in his convictions regarding when this occurs. The more philosophically significant point of divergence, divergence on the matter of the nature of the origin of reason, emerges as a consequence of the way Derrida frames the cogito, which on his reading of the text comes to coincide with the moment of madness's expulsion. So Foucault thinks madness gets excluded right at the beginning of the meditations. Derrida thinks that the meditator gets up to the point of the cogito, can experience the truth of the cogito, and then at, after that point, shortly after that point, madness is expelled. The truth of the cogito, Derrida argues, remains compatible with madness only up to a point. The moment it must be articulated and shared with others or transformed into a form that might be remembered, it must leave madness behind. It must, in other words, become incorporated into the world and time. Descartes must, Derrida writes, temporalize the cogito, which is itself valid only during the instant of intuition the instant of thought being attentive to itself, the sharpest point of the instant. That was a quote. He goes on shortly afterwards, quote, if the cogito is valid for the maddest madman, one must in fact not be mad if one is supposed to reflect and retain it, if one is to communicate it and its meaning, end quote. There is something curious about the suggestion discernible in these last two quotations that the truth of the cogito is compatible with madness, but that the form of meta reflection that makes the cogito valid, the instant of thought being attentive to itself, occurs only as reason becomes fully temporal and hence fully differentiated from madness. Wouldn't this imply that the cogito, which is contingent on the possibility of meta awareness, uh, would, oh, sorry, wouldn't this imply that the, that the cogito, which is contingent on the possibility of meta-awareness, isn't compatible with madness? So when I'm talking about meta-awareness, of course, I just mean uh, you have to be aware that you're thinking to be able to uh, fully appreciate the, the fact that if you are thinking, you must exist. Um, it seems like that, that meta-awareness is a, a key part of things. 
So we will leave this curiosity alone for now and focus on another. Derrida's suggestion here that madness must be excluded the moment truth must translate into discourse. So the, you can sort of arrive at the truth of the cogito, but the moment you have to have that meta awareness or the moment you have to turn it into language that you can share with another person, um, the moment you have to be able to uh, remember it as a thinking thing, um, these are the moments that you have to somehow leave madness behind. Yeah. So Derrida's suggestion here that madness must, must be excluded the moment truth must translate into discourse is in keeping with one of his more general criticisms of the history of madness. It seems Derrida maintains that it is not possible to offer up the history of madness Foucault purports to offer without reiterating the act of exclusion Foucault is attempting to counteract with his text. It seems any history of madness will assume the form of discourse and hence be describable as a form of reason, which in speaking about madness will necessarily talk over madness. It seems Foucault cannot render a madness uh, that has been rendered silent talkative through his proffered history then. His text will necessarily fail with respect to its most significant ambition. It seems odd though to challenge Foucault on the idea that Descartes excludes madness at the beginning of the meditations, Derrida thinks that's wrong, only to suggest that madness is excluded at a later moment of discourse production. Doesn't this ignore the fact that the meditations consist of discourse all along and that the narrative voice guiding the reader is engaged in the process of turning contemplated truths into sentences for itself from the beginning? If this is the case, and as Derrida suggests, it is also the case that madness is incompatible with discourse on the one hand and consciousness's, consciousness's process of relating to itself, of incorporating a past into a present one, uh, sorry, of incorporating a past into a present, um, or of, as Derrida puts this, reflecting on and retaining its insights, then it seems Foucault is the one who must be right about his reading. The meditator must exclude madness at the outset. And in fact, in Foucault's replies to Derrida's essay, he continues to refuse the idea that madness is compatible with the meditative process. He insists on understanding Descartes' meditations taken together as a self-transformative exercise, one akin to the Greek and Roman ascesis, which preoccupied his thinking during the final phase of his life. The meditator, to be transformed by the exercise, must be able to advance a proposition, turn it over, determine its truth or falsity, let the truth they clasp affect them and move on and through others in the same way. It also seems disingenuous of Derrida to suggest that the production of discourse involves a thoroughgoing rejection of madness. If he is specifying the aporia, which gives rise to a system of reason and history in the text as involving reason and madness, then it is open to him to specify the system or rational discourse or history the aporia gives rise to as containing the trace of madness rather than as thoroughly excluding madness. The contrast between Foucault and Derrida ends up being a contrast between a thinker who conceives of reason's origin as an act of exclusion while situating this act squarely within history and a thinker who conceives of reason's origin as a difficult to situate aporia, while, under, while understanding the form of reason it gives rise to as contaminated with the form of madness, which never fully makes itself manifest. The seeming conceptual distinction between a temporalized origin, Foucault's work, a humble, contingent beginning erupting in time, what Foucault casts in Nietzsche genealogy history as the true object of genealogy, or true object, in other words, of the specific form of history writing he is endeavoring to undertake, and an aporetic origin in Derrida's work becomes questionable, becomes questionable quickly. Uh, so this is the part where I'm starting to think about whether we can actually create a division, create the contrast before between, sorry, between Foucault and Derrida. So is it right to think of uh, this story about where the origin lies and what its nature is um, as a story that makes Foucault and Derrida both look sort of incompatible. The point of madness's exclusion in time 
was not the only form of exteriority Foucault was pursuing for one thing. He was also attempting to determine the episteme, the set of inaccessible a priori but contingent and transformable rules governing what it is possible to be, do, and say in any cultural setting, which he consistently articulates as the outside of thought. The episteme corresponds to what Foucault elsewhere calls the archive. The thinker undertaking the project of excavating these rules is always in the awkward position of having only the discourses of a historical moment not exactly coincident with the thinker's own to work off of. Quote, it is not possible for us to describe our own archive, Foucault writes, in the archaeology of knowledge, since it is from these rules that we speak. The moment we manage to think the episteme, we can be assured that it is no longer our episteme. The evidence that allows the thinker to devise the rules governing a prior historical setting to reverse engineer them exists, Foucault suggests, on the surface of cultural documents, on the surface of discourse, in other words. The episteme which makes possible the act of exclusion Foucault preoccupies himself with in the history of madness is more like the condition outside of time that Derrida insists upon. Instead of, being instead of being specified as an aporia, or as a form of madness that can only manifest in history and discourse while sustaining itself at a remove though, it is specified as a system of rules capable of incessant transformation. In one of the texts which constitute the set of Foucault's replies to Derrida, Foucault writes, we are at that point, that fold in time, where a certain technical control of sickness hides rather than designates the movement that closes the experience of madness in on itself. But it is precisely that fold that allows us to unfurl, sorry, but it is precisely that fold which allows us to unfurl that which has been curled up for centuries, mental illness and madness, two different configurations, which are now moving apart before our eyes, or rather, inside our language. It's the last part that I'm sort of stressing. Foucault's attempt to provide a history of madness's exclusion comes into sight then as contingent on the existence of a trace of this madness and its exclusion in discourse rather than impossible, contra Derrida's argument. So Derrida says you can't write a history on madness without covering madness over in the way that you don't want to because any history you write will be a reasonable discourse. And reasonable discourse is just engaged essentially on a, in a soliloquy on madness and it doesn't let madness speak. So Foucault would essentially be doing exactly the same thing uh, by writing a history, but he doesn't want to. He wants to somehow allow this madness that has been buried over to speak. Um, okay, so Derrida consistently articulates his own philosophy. Um, oh, wait, actually, hold on. So I should tie that up uh, in a slightly clearer way. Um, so Derrida is sort of saying that Foucault can't offer the history of madness that he's trying to, um, but what if we understood Foucault as relating to some kind of trace of the form of madness that he's trying to allow to speak? What if we, essentially I'm trying to argue that maybe there's a sense in which Foucault uh, can allow madness to speak as a trace. And if that is the case, then uh, his enterprise actually ends up looking quite like many of, of Derrida's uh, attempts to deconstruct uh, philosophical systems. Um, so the resemblance between Foucault and Derrida is sort of popping. Uh, okay, so Foucault's attempt to provide a history of madness, of madness's exclusion comes into sight then as contingent on the existence of a trace of this madness and, it, and its exclusion in discourse rather than impossible. So it is possible, it's just you're working with a trace rather than with madness itself. Uh, you're letting a trace of madness meet, speak rather than letting madness itself speak. Derrida consistently articulates his own philosophy deconstruction as enabled by the relation it bears to something beyond it and which is present as beyond it in the same way. Sometimes he even specifies this something as madness. The fact that his work dispenses with the principle of non-contradiction in highlighting unresolvable aporias, and that Derrida insists it is not thereby unreasonable 
but rather a new historical form of rational discourse seem in keeping with the suggestion, uh, seem in keeping with his suggestion in his text on the history of madness, that the rational discourse that is philosophy undergoes historical transformation by releasing new reserves from whatever is positioned beyond philosophy, beyond reason at any given moment. It transfigures what is excluded from discourse, from reason, from philosophy, in other words. Philosophy, he writes, lives only by imprisoning madness, but would die as thought if a new speech did not at every instant liberate previous madness while enclosing within itself, in its present existence, the madman of the day. If Derrida's discourse, which hunts a madness that holds itself at a remove, which responds to this madness and attempts to alter current forms of rational discourse through this response is possible, then Foucault's project in the history of madness, which is similarly pursuing or responding, responding to the unthought and unthinkable via the traces available in cultural documents should be. So if Derrida's deconstruction is possible, then Foucault's archaeology of silence, his attempt to let madness speak is sort of possible too in the same way that deconstruction is sort of possible. In other work, I have in mind his work on the poetry of Paul Celan, for instance, Derrida suggests there is a relationship between opaque, uninterpretable texts and processes of witnessing. A meaning that resists interpretation appears in these texts as inaccessible, replicating the structure of situations in which people have had to operate as secondhand witnesses to experiences undergone by murdered persons. These experiences are only manifest as, and can only be attested to as, what they themselves, the witnesses, have not and could not have undergone, since death undermines the possibility of witnessing. Perhaps we can think of Foucault in the history of madness as engaged in a somewhat analogous form of witnessing as he sets out to allow a silenced and covered over form of madness to appear and to speak. Okay, so now I'm moving into the part of the paper where I think about what it would mean to specify the form of madness that Foucault and Derrida have uh, in mind as they're uh, talking to each other uh, as narcissism. I didn't transition to this, this section very well. So the beginning is just sort of abrupt. <laughs> a subject unable to answer the question, am I dreaming or am I awake in the affirmative, Foucault suggests in his replies to Derrida, may nevertheless be able to do what is required for the ascesis, the meditation to get underway. The same is not the case for a subject unable to answer the question, am I mad and unreasonable or am I sane? If this question cannot be answered in the affirmative, he insists, this will leave the meditation stillborn. Surely though, whether it does or doesn't depends on the way madness is specified in the text. Derrida's suggestion that the truth of the cogito is compatible with madness seems to depend on determining madness in a similar way. This is a curious feature of each thinker's work. This is because Derrida and Foucault's respective texts prohibit the specification of madness simultaneously. Foucault is reading the Cartesian gesture of excluding madness as emblematic of a large scale cultural gesture, which institutes a form of reason and a medicalized understanding of madness. Specifying the, the form of madness, which is of interest to Foucault, i.e. the form of madness which is occluded by the discourse on the medicalized variety of madness, would just be to reinforce its occultation, since it would involve making use of categories only instituted by the reason which silences madness through its discourse um, to give madness a determinate form. Specifying the form of madness which is of interest to Derrida would involve a similar violence. Madness, in the schema suggested in his text on Foucault, is beyond discourse. It is that which is manifest only as that which is absent uh, from discourse. So, entertaining how the text transform when madness is specified, specified as pathological narcissism, seems like a careless, naive, uncomprehending gesture, a mad, random gesture. It's my own mad audacity, 
Yet at the same time, can't we appreciate that the force, the persuasiveness of Foucault's replies to Derrida hinge on imagining someone who, using a contemporary vocabulary, we might identify as a person experiencing some form of cognitive disorder. Impaired cognition could impair the, tra the trajectory of the meditations. It would affect the subject's ability to propose and be transformed by its own propositions. But a person with the cold clarity of a psychopath doesn't seem particularly disqualified as a meditator. Similarly, Derrida's proposal that the truth of the cogito before transformed into discourse is compatible with and thus can withstand the madness which envelops it and which it is not clearly distinguishable from seems contingent on imagining a subject who is mad in a certain way. With the truth of the cogito, I necessarily exist whenever I am thinking and aware of it, really be available to a thoroughly adult mind. My decision to explore how Foucault and Derrida's respective conclusions in their reading of Descartes would transform if madness were specified and specified as narcissism is in some ways self-serving and to that extent narcissistic. Selecting narcissism as madness is, as madness is, is avatar <laughs> allows me to draw attention to just the dimensions of Foucault and Derrida's of Foucault and Derrida's work I want to draw attention to ostensibly in an attempt to discuss, to discourse on their exchange on the subject of madness in a fresh way. Different conceptions of the philosophical enterprise itself are discernible in Foucault and Derrida's respective readings of Descartes and the replies on the part of Foucault they spurred. In Nietzsche genealogy history, Foucault follows Nietzsche in suggesting that the genealogist attends to phenomena outside of philosophical discourse to account for the possibility of philosophy itself. Nietzsche obviously attends to cultural phenomena like moral values, the conceptions of good and evil, which encourage the forms of bodily renunciation, which are conducive to philosophizing in an attempt to account for the philosopher's activities. Sometimes he casts the will to power, a desire to dominate, as what is ultimately behind philosophical theorizing. The philosopher strives to create the world in their own image. Because Kant wanted to obey Nietzsche rights, he produced theory that would impel everyone to obey. Foucault refrains from positing drives and bodily phenomena that are not themselves the effects of discourse, but he still seemed to position himself as a thinker who was preoccupied from a vantage point outside of philosophy with thinking about the conditions for philosophical discourse uh, themselves. The reading of Descartes in the history of madness, um, sorry, the reading of Descartes in the history of madness, he retorted in one of his replies to Derrida, was the least significant, the most dispensable section of the book. It should, he states, have actually been excised. The texts and thinkers Foucault has recourse to as he elaborates his histories attest to his desire to stand outside of philosophy. There are exceptions, but for the most part, these are obscure, hardly canonical texts and thinkers. He also, of course, attends to sundry ephemeral documents. The text Derrida devotes his discourse uh, to seem rather more governed by what Foucault would call the author function. In no particular order, people like Plato, Hegel, Kant, Husserl, Heidegger, Freud, Genet, Blanchot, Levinas, Nietzsche, and Rousseau. Occasionally, he can be found attending to the type of document that would have been of interest to Foucault. He pays attention to statements articulating copyright law, for instance, in Detour de Babel. Foucault criticizes Derrida in his replies for saturating the social field with philosophical reason. There is no place outside of the tradition uh, and and one, if Derrida is right, is always forced to try to affect transformations on the tradition from a point of interiority. Deconstruction, Derrida's work, proceeds on the basis of myriad texts Derrida diagnoses as metaphysical. Foucault suggests that Derrida's approach makes it impossible to truly attend to events. Of course, we know that, event, that the events Foucault devotes his discourse to also exist in the form of documents and discourse. So it seems Foucault's status as a thinker more profoundly and rightly trained on the empirical than Derrida is questionable. 
Foucault's sketch of Derrida also obscures the extent to which critique in the form of deconstruction for Derrida hinges on sustaining a relationship to something outside the discourse being critiqued. This is true in a few ways. We already said that philosophical discourse for Derrida transforms by incorporating new reserves from philosophies indeterminate and indeterminable beyond, a beyond he sometimes articulates as madness. At other times, Derrida articulates madness simply as extant discourse and voices which are not presently legible as philosophical, and the open relation deconstruction must sustain to them if it is to be deconstruction. Quote, there is always for me, uh, I guess I shouldn't have said quote, there is always for me, he states in an interview, more than one language, mine and the other. And then he says, I am simplifying a lot. And I must try to write in such a way that the language of the other does not suffer in mine, receives the hospitality of mine without getting lost or integrated there. Um, which is as much to say that madness, a certain madness, must keep a look, uh, sorry, must <laughs> ruin this quotation. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take the quotation from the top. There's always for me, he states in an interview, more than one language, mine and the other. I am simplifying a lot, and I must try to write in such a way that the language of the other does not suffer in mine, receives the hospitality of mine without getting lost or integrated there, which is as much as to say that madness, a certain madness, must keep a lookout over every step, and finally watch over thinking. So there are two ways, like the point, there are two ways that Derrida is actually specifying madness, maybe more. Sometimes it's the thing beyond philosophy, beyond reason, beyond history that only appears as a trace in these things. Um, and other times it's actually like concrete, tangible discourse, actual writing, actual voices uh, in time, uh, in history that uh, are nevertheless conceived as outside of philosophy. Um, okay, so so that is mad, like this out, this other outside is maybe madness, also uh, philosophies. Openness to this other thing is maybe madness. Uh, Derrida's openness to these other voices and other discourses is what he is specifying as madness here in this quotation. The suggestion is in keeping with his insistence toward the end of his essay, The Ends of Man, that deconstruction proceeds by weaving together texts of different natures. We can say that in Derrida's work on the, on the university and its relation to philosophy, Derrida implicitly articulates his own relation to philosophy in a way which makes this relation look quite like the relation that Foucault conceives of himself as bearing towards received canonical forms of philosophy. In this work, Derrida acknowledges that philosophies, that philosophy does crystallize in university settings, in the departments, for instance, that house them. He locates the essence of philosophy elsewhere, however. The quintessential gesture of philosophy is to interrogate its own borders. Philosophy takes everything as an object of reflection and queries everything. It takes even the norms governing current conceptions of philosophy as objects of reflection and potential candidates for reconsideration. This is Derrida's articulation of philosophy in its quintessential form, if that wasn't clear. Often received concrete forms of philosophy will not be the philosophies undertaking this work of transforming philosophy, of critiquing the bounds of proper philosophy. They will take their own norms for granted. The philosophical critique of these philosophies is in an interesting way then, according to Derrida, non-philosophical. It is quintessentially philosophical and yet not acknowledged as philosophical from the vantage point of received philosophy. Deconstruction, Derrida's work, often viewed as Derrida himself states, as a bastard, um, a bastard discourse which reduces philosophy to literature or logic to rhetoric, is quintessentially philosophical and yet not philosophical in the same way. From his ostensible vantage point outside of received philosophy, Foucault displays a consistent preoccupation with the constraints governing discourse production. In the discourse on language, he flags changing conceptions of the mad person in their relation to reason as among these constraints. What it is possible to say while still counting as someone discoursing reasonably varies across historical contexts, depending on the contingent rules governing discourse production in that context. 
It seems the same as the case for what it is possible to say while still counting as someone discoursing philosophically. Derrida, in his thinking on the subject of deconstruction's relation to canonical philosophy, displays preoccupations quite like Foucault's. He asks rhetorically, must not one be interested in the conventions, the institutions, the interpretations that produce and maintain this apparatus of limitations with all the norms and thus all the exclusions they imply? Foucault, for his part, while indicating a flagrant disinterest in discoursing from a point internal to canonical philosophy, still in his interviews, for example, and in his essay, What is Enlightenment?, articulates the project of excavating and critiquing the conditions which make canonical philosophy and much, much more possible as a distinctly philosophical one. This alternative vision of philosophy in Foucault's work is not far removed from Derrida's sketch of philosophy in its quintessential as opposed to received form. So does reason, does philosophy require the exclusion of madness? And more to the point, for my purposes, my purposes, that was sort of a play on, yeah, we get it, we're talking about narcissism, <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> um, how would Foucault and Derrida have, uh, have to reply if madness was specified as pathological narcissism? Could Descartes' meditator sustain the form of lucidity required to truly appreciate the truth of the cogito? Is reason compatible with madness in this sense, uh, compatible with this form of madness? It seems so. Would the narcissist be able to come to discourse without overcoming their narcissism? This too seems possible. A narcissistic discourse is possible. Would the narcissist be able to produce a specifically philosophical discourse without abandoning their narcissism? A more difficult question. Answering it one way or another would seem to depend on one's vision of philosophy. We saw that both Foucault and Derrida position themselves as philosophical and yet outside of received philosophy. Both thinkers' enterprises in different ways are contingent on sustaining a relationship with and openness to alterity, a relation narcissism seems to preempt. Foucault's account of the reflective movement of the meditations as an ascesis allows us to appreciate the fact that the narcissist while perhaps lucid enough to be able to devise the propositions that propel their meditation, would not necessarily be deeply and meaningfully transformed by these propositions. The narcissist tends towards stasis. We could understand the movement of a meditation, of an ascesis undertaken by a narcissist, as one which involves merely consolidating the narcissist's sensibilities and convictions. To what extent, then, is philosophy? philosophy itself and or philosophy in its numerous instantiations within institutions, departments, and texts, legible as narcissistic. So I thought I would like end on a question <laughs> and then have the, the sort of beginning of the text just sort of maybe ricochet around in the background. Um, so I, I sort of refrain from being too heavy handed here <laughs> with my conclusions, uh, but that that is the end. Uh, so thank, thank you so much.